Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Athena for inviting me. Um, can everyone hear all right? Can you hear in the back? Yes, nod, yes, you can hear, okay. Um, I'm gonna read this old short story first. Uh, there's a lot to say about it, but I'm gonna just read it now and if someone uh, wants to ask questions about it during the Q&A, then, then I'll spill the beans. But for now, just sit back and relax, like they say on the plane. Okay, here we go. It's called Boys. Boys enter the house. Boys enter the house. Boys, and with them the ideas of boys, ideas leaden, reductive, inflexible, enter the house. Boys, two of them wound into hospital packaging, boys with infant pattern baldness slung in the arms of parents, boys dreaming of breasts, enter the house. Twin boys, kettles on the boil, boys in hideous vinyl knapsacks that young couples from Edison, New Jersey wear on their shirt fronts, knapsacks coated with baby saliva and staphylococcus and milk vomit enter the house. Two boys, one striking the other with a rubberized hot dog enter the house. Two boys, one of them striking the other with a willow switch about the head and shoulders, the other crying enter the house. Boys enter the house speaking nonsense. Boys enter the house calling for mother. On a Sunday in May, a day one might nearly describe as perfect, an ice cream truck comes slowly down the lane, chimes inducing salivation, and children run after it. Not long after which boys dig a hole in the backyard and bury their younger sister's dolls two feet down so that she will never find these dolls and these dolls will rot in hell, after which boys enter the house. Boys trailing after their father like he's the second goddamned coming of Christ goddamned almighty enter the house, repair to the basement to watch baseball. Boys enter the house, site of devastation, and repair immediately to the kitchen where they mix lighter fluid, vanilla pudding, drain opening lye, balsamic vinegar, blue food coloring, calamine lotion, cottage cheese, ants, a plastic lizard that one received in his Christmas stocking, tacks, leftover mashed potatoes, spam, frozen lima beans, and chocolate syrup in a medium-sized saucepan and heat over low flame until thick, afterwards transferring the contents of this saucepan into a Pyrex lasagna dish, baking the Pyrex lasagna dish in the oven for 19 minutes before attempting to persuade their sister that she should eat the mixture. Later, they smash three family heirlooms in a two and a half hour stretch, whereupon they are sent to their bedroom until freed in each case, 13 minutes after. Boys enter the house starchy and pressed shirts and flannel pants that itch so bad, fresh from Sunday school instruction, blonde and brown locks plastered down, but even so, with a number of cowlicks protruding at odd angles, disconsolate and humbled, uncertain if boyish things such as shooting at the neighbor's dog with a pump action BB gun and gagging the fat boy up the street with a bandana are exempted from the commandment to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and thy neighbor as thyself. Boys enter the house in baseball gear in spikes, in mismatched tube socks that smell like Stilton cheese. Boys enter the house in soccer gear, 
Boys enter the house carrying skates. Boys enter the house with lacrosse sticks and soon after, tossing a lacrosse ball lightly in the living room, they destroy a lamp. One boy enters the house sporting basketball clothes, the other wearing jeans and a sweatshirt. One boy enters the house bleeding profusely and is taken out to get stitches, the other watches. Boys enter the house at the end of term, carrying report cards, sneak around the house like spies of foreign nationality, looking for a place to hide the report cards. One boy with a black eye enters the house, one boy without. Boys with acne enter the house and squeeze and prod large skin blemishes in front of their sister. Boys with acne treatment products hidden about their persons enter the house. Boys standing just up the street sneak cigarettes behind a willow in the Ely's yard. Waves smoke away from their natural fibers, hack terribly, experience nausea, then enter the house. Boys call each other retard, homo, geek, and later necklace thug, theater fag, and then enter the house exchanging further epithets. Boys enter the house with nose hair clippers, chase sister around the house, threatening to depilate her eyebrows. She cries. Boys attempt to induce girls to whom they would not have spoken only six or eight months prior to enter the house with them. Boys enter the house with girls efflorescent and homely and attempt to induce girls to sneak into their bedroom as they still share a single bedroom. Girls refuse. Boys enter the house, go to separate bedrooms. Boys with their father, an arm around each, enter the house. But of the monologue preceding and succeeding this entrance, not a syllable is preserved. Boys enter the house, having masturbated in a variety of locales. Boys enter the house, having masturbated in train station bathrooms, in forests, in beach houses, in football bleachers at night under the stars, in cars under a blanket, in the shower backstage on a plane. The boys masturbate constantly, identically, three times a day in some cases, desire like a madness upon them, at the mere sound of certain words, words that sound like other words, interrogative, reminding them of intercourse, beast, reminding them of breast, sects, reminding them of sex, and so forth. The boys are not very smart yet. And as they enter the house, they feel as always immense shame at the scale of this self-abusive cogitation seeing a classmate, seeing a billboard, seeing a fire hydrant, seeing things that should not induce thoughts of masturbation and then thinking of masturbation anyway. Boys enter the house, go to their rooms, remove sexually explicit magazines from hidden stashes, put on loud music, feel despair. Boys enter the house worried, they argue, the boys are ugly, they are failures, they will never be loved, they enter the house. Boys enter the house and kiss their mother, who feels differently now that they have outgrown her. Boys enter the house, kiss their mother, she explains the seriousness of their sister's difficulty, her diagnosis. Boys enter the house, having attempted to locate the spot in the yard where the dolls were buried eight or nine years prior without success. They go to their sister's room. They sit by her bed. Boys enter the house and tell their completely bald sister jokes about baldness. Boys hold either hand of their sister, laying aside differences having trudged grimly into the house. Boys skip school 
enter house, hold vigil. Boys enter the house after their parents have both gone off to work, sit with their sister and with their sister's nurse. Boys enter the house carrying cases of beer. Boys enter the house very worried now, didn't know more worry was possible. Boys enter the house carrying controlled substances, neither having told the other that he is carrying a controlled substance, though an intoxicated posture seems appropriate under the circumstances. Boys enter the house weeping and hear weeping around them. Boys enter the house embarrassed, silent, anguished, keening, afflicted, angry, woeful, grief-stricken. Boys enter the house on vacation. Each clasps the hand of the other with genuine warmth, the one wearing dark colors and having shaved a portion of his head, the other having grown his hair out longish and wearing uncharacteristically a tie-dyed shirt. Boys enter the house on vacation and argue bitterly about politics, one boy supporting the Maoist insurgency in a certain Southeast Asian country, one believing that to change the system, you need to work inside it. One boy threatens to beat the living shit out of the other, refuses creme brulee, though it's created by his mother in order to keep the peace. One boy writes home and thereby enters the house only through a mail slot. He argues that the other boy is crypto-fascist, believing that the market can seek its own level on questions of ethics and morals. Boys enter the house on vacation and announce future professions. Boys enter the house on vacation and change their minds about professions. Boys enter the house on vacation and one boy brings home a sweetheart but throws a tantrum when it's suggested that the sweetheart will have to retire on the folding bed in the basement. The other, having no sweetheart, is distant and withdrawn, preferring to talk late into the night about family members gone from this world. Boys enter the house several weeks apart. Boys enter the house on days of heavy rain. Boys enter the house in different calendar years. And upon entering, the boys seem to do nothing but compose manifestos for the benefit of their parents. They follow their mother around the place, having fashioned their manifestos in celebration of this brand new independence. Mom, I like to lie in bed late into the morning watching game shows. Or, I'm never going to date anyone but artists from now on. Or, a man should eat bologna. Sliced meats are important. Or, an American should bowl at least once a year. But these manifestos apply only for brief spells, after which they are reversed or discarded. Boys don't enter the house at all, except as ghostly after images of younger selves, fleeting images of sneakers dashing up the staircase, soggy towels on the floor of the bathroom, blue jeans coiled like snakes in the basin of the washing machine, boys as an absence of boys, blissful at first. You put a thing down on a spot, you put this book down, you come back later, it's still there. You buy a box of cookies, you eat three, later three are missing. Nevertheless, when boys next enter the house, which ultimately they must do, it's a relief. Even if it's only in preparation for weddings of acquaintances from boyhood, one boy has a beard neatly trimmed, the other has rakish sideburns. One boy wears a hat, the other boy thinks hats are ridiculous. One boy wears khakis pleated at the waist, the other wears denim, but each changes into his suit as those suits are the liminary marker of adulthood. Boys enter the house after the wedding and they're slapping each other in the back and yelling at anyone who will listen, it's a party. One boy enters the house carried by friends, having been arrested after the wedding for driving while intoxicated, 
complexion ashen. The other boy tries to keep his mouth shut. The car is on its side in a ditch. The car has the top half of a tree broken over it. The car has struck another car, which has struck a third, and everyone will have seen. One boy misses his brother horribly, misses the past, misses a time worth being nostalgic over, a time that never existed. Back when they set their sister's playhouse on fire, the other boy avoids all mention of that time. Each of them is once the boy who enters the house alone, missing the other. Each is devoted and each callous, and each plays his part in the telephone over the course of months. Boys enter the house with fishing gear, according to prearranged date and time, arguing about whether to use lures or live bait in order to meet their father for the fishing adventure. After which boys enter the house again with live bait, having settled the question. Boys boast of having caught fish in the past, though no fish was ever caught. Boys enter the house carrying their father slumped. Happens so fast. Boys rush into the house, leading EMTs to the couch in the living room where the body lies. Boys enter the house. Boys enter the house. Boys enter the house. Boys hold open the threshold awesome threshold that welcomed them when they weren't even able to welcome themselves. That threshold which welcomed them when they had to be taken in. Here's its tarnished knocker. Here's its euphonious bell. Here's where the boys had to sand the door down because it never would hang right in the frame. Here are the scuff marks from when boys were on the wrong side of the door demanding Here's where there were once milk bottles for the milkman. Here's where the newspaper always landed. Here's the mail slot. Here's the light on the front step illuminated. Here's where the boys are standing as that beloved man is carried out. Boys, no longer boys, exit. Now we move on to the ridiculous. And uh, my new novel is um, sort of a story within a story. And uh, I guess what happened is I was, in, I was part of an auction by a, a First Amendment charity uh, to raise money in defense of the First Amendment where a character, an unnamed character in my book was to be auctioned off and whoever paid the most money, I had to use their name for this character. And uh, several weeks later, the email arrived that one Montese Crandall had proven victorious in the matter of my character name. and. I didn't know that the novel was going to be a story within a story until Montese Crandall appeared to write the entire novel. And uh, so before it even gets underway, Montese interrupts ostensibly to write a short introduction, which turns out to be 90 pages long, uh, all about the life and times of Montese Crandall. So this is the beginning of that. The section is called From the Desk of Montese Crandall, Master of Fine Arts. People often ask me where I get my ideas. Or on one occasion back in 2024, I was asked. This was at a reading in an old-fashioned used media outlet right here in town, the store called Arachnids Incorporated. The audience consisted of five intrepid and stalwart folks 
four out of the five, no doubt intent on surfing aimlessly at consoles, or perhaps they intended to leave the store when instead they were herded into a cluster of uncomfortable petrochemical multi-use furniture modules by Noel Stroop, the hard-drinking owner-operator of the shop in question. I'd been pestering Noel about a reading for some time, months, despite the fact that Arachnids was not celebrated for its calendar of arts-related programming. To be honest, the reason for this pestering had most to do with my wife, who'd spend her remaining time on Earth counseling me on just how to boost my product. Ask Noel, my wife said, her eyes full of implacable purpose. We used to see Noel at the flea market, which by now took up more than a dozen city blocks. There were more flea markets than licensed tax-paying emporia here in Rio Blanco. I had a booth where on weekends, I hawked old baseball cards and other sports memorabilia. In fact, I still do. It was here at the flea market, according to my wife's plans, that I screwed up my non-existent courage one Sunday and said to Noel Stroop, who is busy selling software modules, something called a compact disc and e-book files. Hey, Noel, what's a guy like me, a literary innovator, have to do in this town to get some respect? Perhaps you're wondering what I have done to merit such a high opinion of my legacy. What is the nature of the Montese Crandall literary innovation? I'm gonna take the remainder of these paragraphs to explicate fully my response to this question. Let me throw down the gauntlet and remark that I, Montese Crandall, write very short, very condensed literary pieces, and by short, I mean very, very short. Shorter than you've probably read in your reading life. More than one word, usually, because one word is too easy, but quite a bit more modest than five score. The 350 pages of a novel, according to the argument I am want to advance, are tedious elaboration. As I understand it, death, war, and adultery are the major novelistic themes, and these were all dispensed with well before Christ got nailed to his block of wood. The 19th century novel, you opine? The 19th century novel does have it all, attic dwelling harridans, uncanny coincidences, advantageous marriages to strong silent landowners, orphans, revolutions, wailing, you can't go wrong with the 19th century novel, but much of what has been written since amounts to imitation, barely warmed over by writers with strange grammatical inclinations. Love, lorn women of Canada, incest on the southern plantation, drug using editorial assistants. We've heard it all before. Yours truly, Montese Crandall, living out his Pacific middle age in a college town next door over to nowhere at all, is unwilling to add more roughage to this diet. One thing the late 20th century was good at, besides mass marketing, pairing away, omitting needless words, alluding without overstating dust bunny, under radiator, cockroach, on window blind, scotch bottles, heartbreak in the food court, impotence, subdivisions, melanoma, muffler problems, Upon the advent of the digital age, as you know, writers who went on and on just didn't last. You couldn't read all that nonsense on a screen. Fragmentation became the one true way. Additionally, this strategic reduction blurred the line between poetry and prose, which is where I, 
Montez Crandall come into the story. I, Montez Crandall, rely heavily on such strategies as alliteration, condensation, the strange ghostly echo of metrical feet, iams and dactyls, spondees and amphibracts. For example, here's a pair of amphibracts, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, that might very well summarize my entire output. Romantic objective. The phrase does have a fine euphony. My first groundbreaking and innovative one-sentence story occurred in the following way. I'd been working on a 45-page erotic novella that was loosely based on my boundless physical desire for my wife, Tara Schott Crandall. The sequence in which I performed a certain advanced delight upon her delicately canted pelvis ran well over 20 pages and her mews and snorts of erotic transport, as described in the text, would pierce the waxy consciousnesses of neighbors up and down the block. Her cries of delight, as described therein, were likened to the coyote howling on the mesa, the kettle shrilling on the stovetop. Sopranos and local opera companies would hang their heads, for they knew that when Tara shot Crandall climaxed, they were out of a job. I am afraid that I cut the entire passage, the erotic part. And not only that, then I cut the opening and the ending. I cut a lot of the middle. I cut the part where we were postcoitally sharing a glass of Van Ordinaire. Next, I cut the astoundingly tender moment in the story where, in snappy dialogue, Tara and I revisited our assignations past the time in the back of the minivan, the time in the woods where we got poison ivy, the time in the press box at the basketball game. For a while, a single scene remained in which the Tara character, called Serena in this early draft, sent me out after lovemaking for eggs. Eggs. So beautiful. So fecund likely to balance on their oblong points during the equinoxes. Symbols of fertility, available in multiple sizes, including jumbo. I couldn't let go of this scene for a while. You know how this is. And yet after three months of wrestling with that story, I cut the entire tangle of misbegotten sentences, the whole sprawling mess, or almost all of it, leaving none at last but the following. Go get some eggs, you dwarf. I don't expect everyone reading this introduction to see immediately the merit in this sentence. And yet the awakening, the unfolding that occurred to me after a relaxed consideration of the six words that remained of my longer work, this unfolding located itself in the fact that the more I read and reread the sentence above, the better I liked it. I printed it out in various fonts. I, I pulled my few remaining hairs out, trying to decide whether to cut the word go. I pronounced the entirety of the story aloud to myself while walking from our ramshackle subdivision to the shipping offices, where I then occasionally pulled a shift. I would intone the sentence while going past the shuttered health and beauty aids purveyor on 22nd and Mountain. I would, say it, I would say it while taking my number at the woebegone post office on 6th. I shouted it at the beckoning doors of the gay bars of 4th Avenue. I said it to myself at the food co-op as if the eggs in question were an actual part of a shopping agenda. I can't tell you how long it took me in my ecstatically creative state to realize that in fact there need not be an exclamation point at the end. My wife, whose health situation had taken a rather unsettling turn, never approved of the long version of the story, though she generally supported whatever wind blew me along in my compositional hobbies, as long as I took seriously the post-compositional portion of the writer's life and got out there to sell, sell, sell. 
She did, however, enjoy go get some eggs, you dwarf. Where, my wife inquired, was I going to publish this story? Was I going to pit against one another some nationally recognized periodicals? And what about book publication? Had I considered a run of hardcovers? In fact, I secured an agreement with a little web periodical called Mud Hut, where my story got an entire page to itself. Not six months later, fresh from the victory just described, I came up with what I like to think of as the second finest narrative I've ever composed. And yet, before I type out for you that magnificence, I should describe what I look like, because it bears on the interpretation of this second effort. I am, you should know, in my late 40s, and it is simply being honest to note that my metabolism which was doing wind sprints and stomach crunches throughout the dark ages of my 20s, has lately taken an ill-advised nap. I am now the site of an unmistakable sag, as if some avalanche stirred at the crest of my solar plexus and sent all the flab in my northern latitudes down towards my once noble pubic swell. With fancy holographic belt buckles, do I attempt to restrain my stampeding softness in vain? Additionally, my hair is thinning, and my skin, which once had the virtue of being free from the blemishes that trouble the young, is now mottled and flaky. Burst blood vessels lead the eye of any observer astray around my nose. I am yoked to bifocals for my ocular needs. I have fallen arches, hammer toes. My only virtues as a physical specimen are my sideburns, which are like the pelts of a rare woodland animal. My sideburns are not to be ignored. No one, let it be said, would mistake me for a pugilist, for a law and order type of guy, for a person drawn to physical conflicts, for a militarist. I do not carry a taser or other weapon loaded or unloaded, though this is legal and even encouraged in my state. However, I could write at least five pages about these sorts of weapons, the Gatling, the Armalite, the Glock, the Proton Disruptor, revealing a complex and deeply seated need for appurtenances of male power and phallic supremacy, supremacy even as I disdain these commonplaces in my everyday, everyday life and incline in an era of Islamist saber rattling toward a foreign policy of tolerance and non-intervention. And yet, as you will have surmised at this point, the five pages of such a story would sooner or later be stripped of elaborations, adjectives, adverbs, similes, astute geopolitical views, until what remained was only we went with the stealth bomber. This was a sentence of such limpid beauty and such durability that it was very difficult to follow up, notwithstanding an unprecedented second publication on the Mud Hut site. So affecting was the sentence, in fact, that there was a danger in having composed it, namely that I would retreat to the reliable paycheck of some day job becoming, for example, an exclusive buyer and seller of baseball cards and sports memorabilia without composing again. I don't know how many months went by. During this time, my argument was simply, why bother? Have I not already proven myself? Have I not written a timeless epic from the front lines of the military industrial complex, which in the third decade of the new millennium we now know to be not only a complex, but more or less the entire shebang. The answer was yes. There was no longer a need to prove my dominance in the writing field. In fact, what I craved instead, here at the top of my game, was domesticity. The ability to control a little narrow patch of scorpion and tarantula infested dry land around a single story house in a town where it never rained. Yet professionalism being what it was, 
In due course, a suite of stories in the first person followed. Apparently, I could not stop. In general, I much prefer a narration from the third person point of view. The first person is tiresome and confining. It is the voice of narcissists and borderline personalities. Still, my wife, whose problem was a respiratory problem, was getting worse. She was fast approaching her double lung transplant, and while it would have been easy to just wait around until her name came up on the international organ lottery, while it would have been easy to collect the meager government funds dispersed to her as a citizen with a chronic genetic condition, I did, in fact, need some avenue of self-expression. Along came the idea for my masterful trilogy. If you like, if it helps you understand the kinds of influences that resulted in the literary coming of age of Montes Crandall, you may think of these next three stories as related thematically to the three volume compositions of the 19th century, not unlike A Doorstopper by Thackeray or Trout. Well, actually on advice of counsel and in order to avoid violating my own copyright with regard to a future collected works of Montes Crandall presently being discussed at one of the larger presses, I'm advised to forego quote, quotation from these works from the middle period. I'm sure you understand. Years had passed in my writerly biography, it seemed to me. Years of dreams and ambitions. Years of seeing other less equipped artists finding publication, even renown in web publishing venues or small press publication, while I had y as yet completed only five publishable sentences. Notwithstanding my education at a state school in the Northeast and a MFA degree from an online program in the Rust Belt. As a result, I was in no position to suppress my trilogy or to recall its publication, which constituted a full 60% of my output. Not every work by a writer is his best, especially when he's preoccupied with homely responsibilities. One of these being the resale of baseball cards obtained from the disgruntled mothers of the world who, as you know, have forged an international conspiracy to throw out baseball cards in order to drive up prices. My other activity consisted of lugging oxygen tanks around my house. There was also the vigorous pounding on the back of my wife, Tara, which was occasionally necessary in the mornings so that she could take advantage of life. I loved my wife. I comforted her when she needed comforting. My wife, understand, was going to die. And she knew it, and I knew it, and now you know it too. When the breeze blew up across the waterless tundra of my state, I often thought, if only I could just harness some of that breeze, and give it to Tara, our problems would be resolved. There are no sailboats in my part of the country that need the breezes. The jet pilots would be happy to encounter less clear air turbulence. State officials have resisted wind farms at every turn. And the earthly atmosphere that shrink wraps the globe offers a rich supply of oxygen. Why couldn't my wife, Tara, have a bit of it in her bloodstream? What made her so undeserving? With this going on, you see, I sometimes didn't feel like writing. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to take some questions. Questions? What inspired the first one, the first story of boys? Um, I was teaching at a, a low residency program at Bennington College, and they had readings every night. And at that time, there was this vogue sweeping through the low residency MFA world for a kind of story called the short short or the flash fiction. 
usually stories under a thousand words. I'd never written a short short. And uh, because everybody was doing it, I thought I should try to do it to see if it was within my range of vision. And there was a reading that night by this Southern writer called Max Steele. Great, very interesting writer. Um, somewhat traditional, although very funny often. And I was sitting way in the back because uh, I had arrived late. And he was reading, and he had this very thick southern accent. And so I could make out not the entire story. It was actually a sort of dense thicket of southern language that I couldn't penetrate. But at a certain point, I heard him say, Then the boys entered the house. And I thought it was the most incredible thing. So I got the pen out, and I actually wrote it on my palm. And I just decided that I would make my short short just variations on this one sentence. And initially, my compact was to only write one sentence a day, which I did for about a week. And then I got too excited, and I sort of finished the draft. So that was the point of origin. I mean, I think the boy part of the thematic material is close to my own heart. I have three stepbrothers and one real brother, so there were a lot of boys in the house. Um, and so I, I may not have practiced everything that happened in the story, especially not the masturbation part. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I know my boys. So that's kind of how it came about. Um, <clears throat> um, you you um, have a very rollicking style of writing. You you, um, you seem to be very dangerous with a um, metaphor as well. Um, one thing that I noticed uh, in both of the selections that you had read was that um, the um, women characters don't have a very long life expectancy. Um, and, uh, and if they're not dying, then they're having uh, operatic orgasms or just alienating you in some way. I'm not sure, trying to be like a smart ass or anything like that. Um, is that um, intentional in some way? Or how do you construct female characters or what exactly um, are you trying to get out of them? Well, I think you're missing a really important character in what I read because all of boys is from the mother's point of view. The mother is in fact the narrator of the story, but just in a very, um, a very understated way. It's all from her point of view. And so she's the perceiver of all this and it's, the poetry in the story for me comes from that um, understated narratorial stance. And I think of her as the rock. And in fact, if you were going to ask me to tease out why it is that the sentence boys entered the house is of interest to me, I would probably hew close to a cheap ass Freudian reading and tell you that the house is the woman. And that in fact, these boys are always orbiting around their mother. Their mother is the centerpiece of the story. So it may seem that the women all die uh, in a superficial reading, uh, but I don't think that that's really the case exactly. Although I like dramatic situations, and um, so a certain amount of pushing the characters into moments that are heightened emotionally makes for good drama. I'll give you one last answer, which is the autobiographical reading uh, for those such as would wish for it. All of demonology was written in the two years after my sister died. Thank you, uh, thank you for the readings. They were very nice. For the sake of our students, I was wondering if you could tell us a little about the evolution of yourself as a writer and, and perhaps something of your work habits as a writer. Um, I sort of 
put off for a very long time identifying myself as a writer. I wrote without claiming the noun for myself. And that was the case because I thought of myself as a reader, not as a writer. So the way I got started was that I was a, a voracious consumer of fiction. In fact, I was remembering the other day, I, I went off to school when I was 13. I actually went off to boarding school at 13. And this place that I went where I was horribly homesick had this awesome library of contemporary fiction. And I used to just roam around in that library picking things because I liked the spine or because the title seemed interesting and the jacket was good. It was almost like that was that row of shelves was my initial peer group when I went off to school. I remember, for example, picking Portnoy's Complaint because it had this very garish jacket, you know. Uh, and I loved Catcher in the Rye because of the simplicity of that jacket, you know. So, uh, so I wrote first because I had read so, uh, so voraciously and was so in love with the books that I read that it occurred to me that I might try to contribute to this shelf of, of my friends, you know. Um, I knew that I wasn't very good at first and, and that persisted well into my actual professional life, sort of feeling that I was inadequate to this ambition to be on the shelf with those other books, you know. But once you begin, uh, the practice of it becomes satisfying, at least to me. I began to think of myself as a writer because simply because I practiced it so religiously. And the habit in general for me is a couple of hours a day, say two to three hours a day of sustained attention. And I'm not allowed to get up unless I've written 1,500 words. So uh, sometimes that goes very quickly, and I could do it in half an hour. And other times it's very difficult, and I'm not sure I'll get there at all. Uh, but it's just like, to me now, it's just like going to the gym and hitting the free weights or eating properly or going for a run or what have you. It's part of my psychic chemistry and my physical makeup and I just apply myself to that craft and um, do a little bit every day. So it's the journey of a thousand miles that starts with a step, I guess. Uh, Rick, I have a question about uh, how do you strike a balance between musicality and content? I remember you saying something about that. Could you talk about that? I think fiction has to have narrative content or else it just doesn't go. And the purely musical or the primarily musical is more a poetic uh, register. You know, So I see myself in a story like boys trying to accomplish a little of both things and to perhaps stand in between the generic designations a little bit to be hybridized but not to be poetical in a precious sentimental way but just to attend to sound because after all you can't write in language without engaging the sonic register because language is a sonic medium you know so it seems to me it's inherently musical and the question is just where do you make a stopping point you know and when I've been at my most lyrically engaged in the beginning of Purple America, for example, or this story, or there are a few other examples. Um, the way I keep from soaring off into poetry land is to make sure that that narrative muscle is getting used. So it has to start somewhere and go to another place. It has to have conflict. It has to have dramatic movement. You know, otherwise there's a a, preci a preciosity that results because of it. Any further questions? Well, um, thank you so much. Thank right. you. Thank you.